lesson in your pew Bibles. See, it's, a, it's found in your pew Bibles on page 1,525. Page 1,525. Okay, once again, scripture lesson is found in a few Bibles on page 1525. It's Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 14. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 14. <clears throat> Excuse me, in your few Bibles. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has, has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and linen, in, in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of, of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Amen. 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 Again, reminder, uh, after service, that we're going to have our luncheon. So, And I was joking, if even if your name is not there, uh, I'm sure there's plenty of food. Uh, so please come and enjoy with us. I do want to thank Evelyn for all her hard work. Even though she told me not to mention her, that's exactly why I mentioned her. Never like being told, wasn't it? <laughs> Praise to God. Praise God, of course. Uh, I also want to thank Junie, who did a great deal of work as well. And Denise, who's sitting right next to her, thank you so much. Three ladies who keep jumping in to do all, all this hard work. And you'll see when you get down there, just how great it looks. My wife's like, yeah, maybe we should get them involved to like do this kind of work and we can rent out the place. My goodness, people will rent out easily. To, uh, I don't see my brother Randy, but uh, I know he did. He's, uh, he was also instrumental in, uh, in getting the food and stuff. And if anybody else, I, did I miss anybody else? I think I, think I got the, the main people who were doing the work. Um, and also, of course, uh, Christmas Eve, sir, uh, New Year's Eve service uh, will be the 31st. If you're interested in coming, please sign up. We still have time to sign up. And uh, again, we're just going to have, you know, little little stuff to eat and so no, nothing major. And uh, just listen to some good Christian music and celebrate together. I'll bring a little message and uh, we'll, you know, we'll bring in the new year in the Lord. Um you know, if you ask most people what is the most joyful time of the year, the likelihood is most people would say Christmas. A lot of people find this. Even, even, even people who are not necessarily joyful or joyous type people, they find even more felicity during this time. Even if you're a Scrooge, you, you tend to still be kind of crack a bit and you're smiling a little bit more, a little bit happier, stuff like that. And, um, and there was a song, of course, that really capture that when you think about it. When Isaac Watts wrote, it, wrote his song in 1719, uh, Joy to the World, it became one of the favorite Christian songs, Christian hymns for the, for the season. But if you think about it, it's not really a Christian hymn per se. It's only one line that's about the birth of Christ. Everything else is about like the second coming and the eschatological things, how God's going to renew all things. And, but only the first line. There's no mention of Mary, Joseph, angels, shepherds, nothing. But it captures well the sense of joy, that joy is what has come into the world, that joy is what we have because of Christ, and that it's joy to the world. It's not joy to the Americans only, or only um, you know, uh, joy to the Russians, or only joy to the Ukrainians, or joy to the Arab nations, or only joy to Israel. It's joy to all, South and North Korea. It's joy for the whole world. Uh, and that's a great message. And some people, of course, don't don't like that. They don't seem to have like the cheeriness of uh, 
uh, of uh, of Christmas, especially atheists. I find that atheists, like, I, I don't know what they've done this year. Every year is almost like, let's flip a coin. Let's see what they're going to do this year. My favorite, all-time favorite, was the year when they started objecting to Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer because they had religious overtones. <clears throat> religious overtones. I, I, I looked over the, the lyrics. I said, did I miss something? Did I miss something in this song? I'm thinking, or maybe they, they're just concerned because it kind of makes me it's because it points to the Druids or those who worship reindeers. I mean, some sort of cult. that. Were, I mean, seriously, I, there's nothing in Rudolph the Red and those reindeer that has religious overtones. But somehow they were offended by that. So you can see how they, were offend, they are offended during this time. Because you turn on the radio and there's Christmas music. music. And I'm not just talking, all oh, Santa Claus songs. I, I, I'll listen to a secular station. All of a sudden I hear Holy Night. And I'm like, wow, man, talk about breaking the barriers. So there is that sense in people's celebration. But despite all celebration that we can sing, all the hymns we can sing, the first ones to sing of the birth of Christ was an angelic chorus, not a human chorus. The angels appeared and they sang, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. I wonder how long did they rehearse that, huh? In anticipation for, for that day of being able to, to welcome in uh, the Christ child. Of course, today when we think of angels, unless you have like a very well uh, idea of, of angelic things, people don't normally think of angels, think of like little fat cherubs with arrows, like, you know, Cupid type thing. You know, and that's certainly far from who they really are. I remember I saw this cartoon years ago where this little boy praying and these two angels show up. Well, they look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, and, and they got swords. And one of them says to the kid, not what you were expecting, right? <laughs> and it's like, that's what angels are. Angels are glorious. They're amazing. They're so amazing that when they appear before people, people are afraid. They tremble. They think they're going to die. Some of them even fall at the feet of angels and seek to worship them. When, when John is confronted by an angel in the book of Revelation, he kneels down to worship and the angel has to remind them, hey, get up, I'm a servant just like you are. You know, The Bible talks at least about eight different types of angels. So it's not like, oh, they had just one angel. There are different types. And these angels were, have been a part of all that God has done. They were there when God created the heavens and the earth. They were there when God created Adam and Eve, when he created humanity, when he created all these things. And they saw it all. Of course, it was an angel himself, a fallen angel, who led to the demise of Adam and Eve, who led to destruction and brought sin into, into, the, into our creation. Uh, but the angels saw everything. They saw when God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, saw how God directed the people of, of Israel, all the things that they went through, leading all the way, of course, to the birth of the baby Jesus. And they knew it was coming. They knew it was coming. It was prophesied. They understood that this day was coming, that the infinite was going to become finite. That God, the second person of Trinity, whom they worshipped in heaven, was now going to come and be there born in a stable. And so they come and preaching the good news of what is to come. That the God of the galaxies, the God who has created all things, the Alpha and the Omega, was going to be born as a baby. And that's profound. You know, when people say, hey, I, I you know... We can see God in nature. You know, like today, the psalm that you read, ironically, is seeing God in nature. Yes, definitely. God is in nature, and we see the glories of God everywhere. But it's so great when it goes beyond nature to something that you experience. It wasn't something that I see or hear. So that's something that I feel, that I've experienced the living God. That's when you're really brought to your knees. When you're not only made aware of Him, but also His presence is there. And you've been to Bethlehem, you understand who Christ is, and you kneel down and worship the baby. And we wait, we, we, we wish that all of humanity would embrace this. That if all humanity would embrace the Prince of Peace, we would have peace. But we don't. The fact is that most people, no matter how much they talk about peace and peace, there is no peace. You know, there was once uh, a cynical quote that I read and I thought this really, you know, when I was young, I hated it because when you're young, you're very idealistic. You really believe that you can change the world. We can do everything, you know. Uh, but when you're older, you realize, wow, this world's really messed up. <laughs> People are really messed up. And, you know, and you go from one bad leader to another bad leader to one, uh, one war to another war. And you're like, man. And this person said, the quote said, <clears throat> peace is that moment. When people stop to reload. 
And I thought, wow, that is so cynically true. Even when you're here today about like, <clears throat> oh, let's have a ceasefire. Let's see. Have a, and what does ceasefire mean? It means give me time to get more ammunition. Give me time to realize what I'm going to do next <laughs> and how I'm going to fight you. That's what it did. It, when they have a ceasefire, they're not plotting peace and reconciliation. They're plotting the next move yeah. onto how they're going to destroy the, their enemy. It's horrible, you know? And of course, this all comes down to me thinking that always the problem, the problem with humanity is always the other guy, right? You know, Ann Landers wrote an article where she talked about uh, all the horrors of nuclear war and said, you know, send a clipping to your, to your president. And the president, of course, got hundreds of clippings. And weeks later, he wrote to Ann Landers. And one of the things he said was, I think you sent them to the wrong place. They should have been sent to the Kremlin. That's exactly how we think. Why is there no peace in the world? Because of him. Because of you. Because of you, you, you. Not because of me. We always think there's no peace in the world because of others, not ourselves. And that, and when someone says that, you know that they have not been in Bethlehem. They have not met the Christ child. They do not know the Prince of Peace. G.K. Chesterton said it so well, he says, there is something wrong with the world, it is me. That is the realization of how peace is finally formed. When we come to a realization that we are sinners, we are bad, left to ourselves, you know, we would sin. If it wasn't for God, we would not seek after God. If it wasn't for God, we would not be saved. It's because he came looking for us that he wooed us. I certainly, you know, I dear knows I'm, I'm a free, I believe in free will all the way. But I know that without the grace of God, we are prone to wander, prone to leave the things of God, prone to sin, prone to become depraved. Because without the grace of God, you only have one place to go, down. Because God is the God of life, the God of, of, of truth. And if you, you don't have Him, you don't have life, you don't have truth, you're going to go down, descend, descend. And you see people when they sin, they never stop at one sin. They keep becoming more decadent and decadent and decadent. And I, I thank the good Lord when we say, oh, people only get to live maybe about 100 years old at, at the most. Well, thank God. Could you imagine if they live longer? If people have, who are becoming depraved live longer, it'd be horror. But that's who we become without God. And we have to realize that we are the problem. We're the ones who need to come to Bethlehem and admit that we're wrong. And once we do, and we accept Christ, and we have the peace of Christ in our lives, the Bible says that we then become peacemakers. Not peacekeepers, which is what the world mostly tries to do. Try to keep the peace. Peacemakers. You try to sow peace wherever you go. You see conflicts between family members. You see conflicts in churches. You see conflicts anywhere. You go and you try to be peace. How can we reconcile? How can we bring things together? But of course, we have to always remember that that peace was bought at a great price. Christ died for our sins. We would not have the peace of God if it wasn't this child came and grew up and died for our sins. So it's a high price that was paid for sin, for our sins. And we need to live with that realization. Now realize that this is not cheap. Peace is not cheap. They also they always make it sound like somehow we can, always, oh, we can have peace. Peace always has a price. The greatest price that ever was paid was the Son of God giving His blood for us. And when we come to the cross, when we come to the manger, we realize we are sinners, we need to repent, and we now want to be recruited to be part of the people that bring transformation. And when we see the evil in the world, we think, how can this transformation occur? Because evil continues to, to push its way through. And we have to continue to push our way through. And sometimes people fail to see God in the very midst of evil and think that, where is God? God is right there. You know, Eli Weisel wrote uh, a number of books. He was actually a Holocaust survivor. He wrote a number of books, but one of them is called Night. And there he talks about the, the horrors of the Holocaust. And there's one part of the book where somebody asked, where is God now? And a voice within him answers, where is he? He is here. He is hanging here on the gallows. Now, when he wrote that, what he meant was God is dead. Here's this Jew saying, there is no God, God is dead. Look at the evil in the world. Ironically, when people read it, many read it differently. They read it as God is there suffering with people. That God is there hanging. Where is Christ? He's hanging on a cross. On the gallows. He's dying. 
Where is God? He is with those who are suffering, those who are oppressed. He hasn't left them. He's there. And on the contrary, the Bible says that he came to take our suffering, our burdens. What a great, we don't have a God who looks at us from a distance and says, you know, good luck. I hope everything works out for you guys. No, we have a God who took on flesh and took the evil upon himself. He took upon himself your sins, your evil. We always like to imagine that, oh, it was Judas. Oh, it was Jewish people. Oh, it was the Romans. No, it was me. It was you that took him to that cross. And we would do it all over again. He came to die for us. And we have to live with that realization that he is in the midst of this very evil. It's like, you know, people look at the evil and think, oh, how, where is God? First of all, I don't even want to get into a theological, philosophical discussion. If you want, you can do that with me after service even more deeply. Because even the fact that people say there's evil in the world, and I'll look at them when they don't believe in God and say, where do you get the idea there's evil? If there is no good. You're judging it. How do you know it's evil? Because you know there's got to be a good. And that's a realization that even there, even the acknowledgement of evil is an acknowledgement that there has to be something that we can judge it against. People who see the evil in the world, they get so angry at God, but they don't believe in God. It's crazy. But this God has come into the world. He's dying for our sins to bring peace, but peace only to those who are willing to have peace. Notice the angel says, glory to God in the highest heaven and earth, peace unto those on whom his favor rests. Uh, another translation says, among those of good will. You know, Christ came to bring peace, but not everyone accepts that peace. That's the reality that we live with. You know, why isn't there peace in the world? Because they don't want to accept Christ. They don't want to accept peace. There are those who love war. There are those who want to be enmeshed in all this. There are people who are greedy. There are people who want more. They, they rather kill and, 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 and take and do whatever rather than to kneel down before God and acknowledge Him and be the power of peace. They don't want to change. They want to continue to be the way that they are. So not everyone does this. So even now, even though Christmas is a time when people are having all the good feelings, you know, you see them everywhere. Like I said, even the Scrooge, are, are there, there's a little bit of smile on their face. There's a little bit of hope in them. They're smiling. They're greeting people. They're happy. Merry Christmas. Bah, bah, bah. It will end. It will end. And much faster than you can imagine. It's almost like a seasonal thing. It's almost like, you, know, it's like you get a flu, they get a seasonal goodness, a seasonal uh, happiness. And for a while, they're greeting everybody and everything. After Christmas, we're back to being nasty. We're back to being this. We're back to being that. And actually, some people never change. Even now, at least before, I remember people were during Christmas, they were so jolly. Now, even during Christmas, you still have people yelling and screaming and because they want to buy this, they want to do that, get out of my way, I'm shopping, blah, blah, blah. And they, they've lost those sense. But some of them do take those moments and they do realize that there is something there and they stop for a while. But for some people, it is like, you know, like it says in the book, uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, it's always winter, but never Christmas. They never really have the joy and peace of the Lord. And all they can do is fabricate. Take whatever they can, whether it's alcohol, drugs, whatever, to, to, to drown their miseries rather than to admit that they are miserable. But, you know, they do have those moments. And we do pray for those moments because those moments are the possibilities where they might hear the gospel and accept the gospel. You know, I read a story about a little boy <clears throat> who was in a store with his mom. And it was kind of like a Walmart place. And he was, uh, and he had a, a balloon, of course, it had helium. And while he's, you know, people are pushing and shoving and moving. And of course, they're so polite. Even to little kids, I'm like amazed. Some of the things I've seen, I'm like, dear Lord, wow. And then they wonder why there's, oh, I don't understand why there's wickedness in the world. Look around, my goodness. Even on a, on, a, on a basic level of being in Walmart, you can't be courteous. And you're knocking over a little kid, you know. And someone bumped into the little kid and the balloon went flying. And the person who was working there at the register says, you know, called the janitor and says, would you please bring a ladder here to retrieve the balloon? And the janitor was, of course, upset. What? She said, I want you to rescue a balloon. So he did. He brought the ladder. And amazing, while he's doing this, people become curious. And they stop. All the bickering, all the pushing, all the registers, everything. Everybody's watching to see this. This is so human, you know? And he goes up, he gets the balloon, brings it down to a little boy. Everybody starts cheering. Yay! And as soon as that's done, bang, right? Back to the registers, back to the pushing, back to this, you know? 
It's amazing. It is crazy. I even heard, I can't remember what, I mean, I'm, I'm sure Victor knows better than I do. I know there was a war. During the war, there was a time when I think the Germans and the English were fighting. And it was Christmas Day, and they actually stopped to say Merry Christmas to each other. And I'm like, cuckoo, cuckoo. You guys have gone nuts. This is crazy. <laughs> you know, that's insanity. But this is the world we live in, that we pause for a moment, and then we go right back to a nonsense, right back to the fighting, right back to all the bitterness and hatred. You know, and if you, and if Christmas is just a pause for you, that's a shame. If Christmas is making you pause, and then you're going to go back to your bickering, and your anger, and your gossip, and your hatred, and your malice, shame on you. Especially if you call yourself a Christian. As Christians, this is the way we should live. Christmas should be every single day. The peace of Christ should be in us every day. We should be living this way and showing it to the world. Not one day out of the year, not one time during the year, but all, all, all year through. You know, the Prince of Peace has already been born. We have already received his peace. Now we need to share that peace with others. You know, and they're not going to know that there is peace unless not only they hear it, but see it in the way that we deal with each other, the way that we deal with our family, the way we deal with people in Walmart, the way we deal with anybody. When they see it, then it's real. Otherwise, it's a hoax. You know? Joy to the world, the Lord is coming. Let earth receive her king. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your great love and mercy towards us. And we thank you, Father, because we know that without Christ, there would be no peace. There would only be ceasefires and negotiations and whatnot. But we know that your son has come to bring real peace. And that peace doesn't, doesn't start in China, or Russia, and America. It begins in our hearts. When we repent of our sins and accept you as Lord and Savior. That with every single person who accepts you and is transformed, the kingdom of God has come and the kingdom of God is spreading and the forces of evil will not be able to stop us. We thank you and praise you in Jesus name. Amen.
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the peace and fellowship of his Holy Spirit go with us until we meet again. Amen. Amen. Amen.